Hey guys, do you like funny video game quotes? Well, check out my book, A Winner Is You, the funniest video game quote with snarky commentary. It has everything from A Winner Is You, All Your Base Belong To Us, and, especially, Are You A Bad Enough Dude To Save The President, and a lot more. So make sure to check out the book in the link below, and if you purchase the physical version from Amazon, you get the Kindle version completely for free. It's one hell of a bargain, so check it out in the link below. Take care. Ryan here, broadcasting all the way from the Popcorn Rocket here in space for awesome video game memories. And I've ran into a bit of Imperial trouble because they don't like it when ships cross into their territory, especially mine. But hey, let's talk about Star Wars and its awesome line of video games because Star Wars, one of the greatest film franchises of all time, also has some of the best video games of all time. And while I'm trying to invade the Imperials, I'm going to show you my awesome video game memories about a whole bunch of Star Wars games. Well, enjoy! Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is X-Wing on the PC. So, being the big fan of Star Wars that I am, and like many people, I've always wanted to fly one of the Starfighters, like the X-Wing, the TIE Fighter, maybe even the Star Destroyer, the Millennium Falcon. So, back in 1993, when LucasArts was still making games, they created X-Wing for us people who wanted to live our dreams of flying one of the starships. So I remember borrowing the original disc version from my friend, it was only like five discs, and um, I remember after I installed it, uh, I couldn't play it because it, it had that copy protection where you had to enter like, um, you, you had to enter some text like from the manual in order to proceed and I didn't really have the manual because I borrowed the, the disc version from my friend. But it was kind of funny though, like my cousin, um, who also wanted to play this game with me, um, uh, he remembered like um, his friend had the manual and one of the um, answers to one of the questions for the copy protection was Masasi, kind of like the Masasi temples on Yavin in episode 4. And so like, um, so what I would have to do is I would, have, I would have to start the game over, like, yeah, so like what I had to do was I would have to exit into DOS like over and over until the question came up that I can, I can enter Masasi for. Um, I kind of forgot what the question was, but kind of one out of ten times I was actually able to play this game. But of course that was solved years later when LucasArts released the X-Wing CD-ROM. So, when you first start playing this game, um, without a manual or without any help, and back then I didn't even have the internet, um, this game was very, very difficult for me. I, I'm like, I had like no idea what I was doing. Um, I didn't know how to target um, enemy starships. I couldn't target the TIE Fighters. I didn't know how to switch the proton torpedoes. I was just kind of waving my mouse everywhere and kind of just, you know, I was, I was like, I was just kind of like shooting everything and I would never hit anything, and I would always like, end up dying or, or probably, probably failing the mission. So because since my cousin and I had no idea how to play this game, but we really wanted to play this game like really badly because we wanted to live our dreams of like piloting an X-Wing in Star Wars, uh, we split our money on this big X-Wing guide um, we bought from B. Dalton, if anyone remembers that store at all. Yeah, so I remember the X-Wing um, guidebook being like this thick and it was actually pretty cool because it was kind of like half story and half strategy guide. Um, like the story was about this pilot called Kev Farlander and how he kind of um, interacts with like Luke Skywalker and the Rebel Alliance. So after kind of reading through the guide, my cousin and I um, 
finally got the hang of playing this game. Um, I think the biggest uh, major difference in like learning how to play this game was it was actually like using you know the top left and right radars so you can see where your enemy is and like using the targeting system and pretty much after that um, it was pretty smooth sailing from there. I mean I learned how to adjust my shields, adjust my lasers, I learned how to target enemies, I learned how to use photon torpedoes and um, how to lock onto enemies. But however, um, I remember the training missions for the X-Wing, the A-Wing, the Y-Wing being pretty easy for the most part. But then once we started doing the tour of duties, that's when the game started getting pretty hard. Yeah, so I remember the tour of duties being pretty tough because you couldn't really use the uh, built-in cheats on the menu or else you couldn't advance in the missions. So I don't really remember it too well, but I know um, if you actually die, um, you mostly tend to eject from your X-Wing, B-Wing, whatever you're piloting at the time, and then you can start the mission over. But however, if you damage um, your eject button um, during battle, you can actually die, die. Like, um, they actually give you like a big funeral, and then um, you're, in a, you're in a casket, then they just like toss you into space, and you kind of have to start um, the um, tour of duties over. <laughs> Yeah, so I remember beating the first two tour of duties. I think there were like 10 missions each. And, and I remember at the end of the third tour of duty is when you actually have to fight against the Death Star. And I was really excited for that. But I was kind of like disappointed um, in like um, the mission before the, um, like the last uh, Death Star mission where you actually go into the trench and have to shoot into the exhaust port. Like, you know, you're on, you're on the Death Star surface, but you only get like one wingmate. I mean, that didn't make any sense to me because like all the previous missions, you have like five or ten wingmates, but you only get one uh, and, and, and you're on the Death Star surface. Yeah, so for the trench run, um, you kind of have to put your shields all the way forward because, you know, like nothing's really going to hit you from the back. And um, what I did was I dropped all my shields down, I would put my lasers all the way up. And like my speed I think was kind of halfway because um, I didn't want to lose my shields because like everything's just kind of coming at you in, in like the Death Star Trench. And I remember um, actually missing the exhaust port like five times in a row. I mean it was like much easier to hit the exhaust port in, in the Super Nintendo version of the Death Star run. And eventually I was able to beat the Death Star and beat the third tour of duty. But then when I got the um, X-Wing Collector's CD-ROM, um, I only got kind of halfway through the fourth tour of duty and it got too difficult for me to continue playing so I just kind of stopped there. Yeah, so to this day I'm still kind of disappointed I wasn't able to beat the last two tour of duties in X-Wing. I mean, I beat the original three but I never got to beat the, you know, like the two add-ons that they did with the X-Wing Collector's CD-ROM. Yeah, so X-Wing for the PC was one of my personal favorite games of all time and it fulfilled everyone's dream of being able to pilot a starfighter in the Star Wars universe and it paved way for its superior sequel, TIE Fighter, which I will talk about in a future episode. Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I am Lord Vader, and I am your father. Oh, no, no. Alright, we're not doing the episode like that. Let's do it again. Hey, welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're talking about today is Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader. That's a lot of rogues for the GameCube. Oh, I need my glasses, sorry. So before 2001, we had a lot of Star Wars games. And luckily, the Star Wars license has always lent itself to really, really awesome games like, you know, the arcade game, X-Wing, TIE Fighter, X-Wing Alliance, um, the Super Star Wars series on the Super Nintendo, you know, a lot of the PC games, you know, Dark Forces, Jedi Knight, and, um, but there was only one th problem I had, though. I accepted the graphics for all these games at the time. Um, I know the Death Star battle looked pretty okay in the arcade game. Um, the Death Star battle looked great on the Super Nintendo. 
and it looked pretty good in X-Wing, but not quite perfect. I mean, I wanted to have a game that had the absolute perfect Death Star battle that you can play in a video game. And we came really close with the Star Wars arcade game from Sega, but um, there was a version for 32X, it looked a bit like a souped up Star Fox, and I didn't have a 32X, and I don't think anyone I knew did. So we had to wait until 2001 to get that perfect Death Star battle, and that was Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2, Rogue Leader. And the Force was definitely with that game. So a couple of weeks before the GameCube came out, you can actually go into stores and buy the games even before the system came out. So rather than buying Luigi's Mansion like most people did, um, I bought Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader and I had you know the game with me but I didn't have the system to play it on for a couple of weeks. So on that fateful day in November of 2001, I waited. Um, two hours in line, I went there at 6 in the morning, I was the 88th person in line to um, a Toys R Us that only had 200 GameCubes and I was able to get my GameCube and play this awesome game. So I hook up my GameCube to my TV and I put this game in and holy shit am I blown away. I mean, just look at these graphics. Just look. Well, they are good for 2001 standards, but Damn, there were good graphics. I mean, I felt like for the first time ever, even though I played a lot of Star Wars games and they've all been great, don't get me wrong, but I was literally playing the movie. Get it? Playing the movie? Huh? Huh? Okay, forget it. So concerning the evolution of the Star Wars games, you know, like, they've always had great graphics for whatever system they had, you know, the music wasn't always from the movie, and even when they did use music from the movies, it wouldn't sound exactly like the movie, and as the game started progressing through the years, you know, at most they um, still had the graphics look almost like the movie, but you know, incredibly blocky, but then when we were able to play these games on CD-ROM, on the PC, on the PlayStation, and other systems. Um, they started using actual music for the movies, which was really cool. But now, we finally had a game that had graphics that looked like the movie, and music for the movie. And in essence, you were playing the movie on a controller this time. Yeah, so I remember I'm um, getting past the um, Death Star missions pretty easily and still being very, very blown away with how freaking awesome the graphics were at the time. And I bet if they did the Death Star now, it would look fantastic. But anyways, um, the good thing is they also added like a lot of other missions. So um, you just weren't playing missions from the movies. Like you had some pretty cool missions like... You know, like you had the Imperial Academy Heist, the Ison Corridor Ambush, you also had the Razor Rendezvous, and you also had Prisons of the Maw. Yeah, so just like every other Star Wars game in existence, um, the difficulty ramps up later in the game, and I personally had a bit of difficulty beating the Raid on Bespin um, the first couple of times. Um, I don't know why it was so hard. And then the difficulty really, really spiked up on the Battle of Endor, which looked freaking gorgeous, and it played like the movie. The music was from the movie. But yeah, I had a pretty hard time, you know, getting past all those TIE Fighters, because there were so many of them. And like, um, you had, but the cool thing was like, um, just like in the X-Wing games, um, but made more simplified, um, you can call on your wingmen to protect you, attack enemies, um, using the control pad, which is really cool. But in all honesty, I found the mission where you're on the surface of the, the Death Star 2 a little more difficult than actually going inside the Death Star 2 itself. I mean, isn't that kind of weird? Yeah, like what was cool too about this game is like you also had passwords and you can access like secret levels that um, that weren't really accessible in the normal game. Um, I remember playing the Revenge on Yavin, you know, being the Imperials this time. And it was like I was playing TIE Fighter, but on the GameCube, which is really cool. And then you can also play um, on the Death Star surface as the Imperials shooting down all the X-Wings so you can kind of see a bit of an alternate Star Wars universe. So, you know, we have the regular universe, the expanded universe, 
And then now we have an alternate universe in the regular universe. What kind of universe is this? It's Star Wars! In a galaxy far, far away. And also cool, and which was also advertised in the back of the case, um, Dennis Lawson, um, the actor for Wedge Antilles, reprises his role in this game, and he does a really good job, and I don't know why he turned down Episode 7. He would have been great in it. Yeah, so even though I had a bit of trouble with the Bespin stage, um, the Battle of Endor, and um, the first Death Star 2 stage, um, this game isn't like really super difficult. I mean, you can definitely beat it if you keep trying and trying and trying again. I mean, you're probably not going to spend too long on each level, but it does provide a pretty decent challenge for a Star Wars game. So the good news is, you can actually get this game pretty cheap on eBay. It's not super expensive. Um, too bad it's not available for, you know, modern systems or computers, because, you know, the whole licensing thing. But I definitely recommend picking it up if you still have a GameCube or original Wii. And I also recommend picking up the sequel and the prequel for this game, which I will cover in new episodes of Awesome Video Game Memories. So Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader was finally the game that delivered the Star Wars experience that I was craving for many, many years. And I would highly, highly recommend getting this game. So that wraps up this episode of Awesome Video Game Memories on Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader. Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is Super Star Wars for the Super Nintendo! Ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -bum. So, what do you get when you combine Contra and Star Wars? Well, it would be really cool to see Bill and Lance shooting stormtroopers, but you get Super Star Wars, one of the premier action games for the Super Nintendo, now on the PlayStation 4. So I do have to admit, even though I'm an 80s kid, I was a bit of a late bloomer to the Star Wars movies. I didn't see Star Wars until I was about 13 in 1994. Like, I knew about the movies, but my cousin was like, Dude, you gotta watch Star Wars so we can talk about it like with everybody else, man! So I went to my local library, I rented the movies, but I was only able to rent episode 4 and episode 6. So I saw them in a different order. I saw A New Hope, Return of the Jedi, then then Empire Strikes Back. And actually, regarding the Super Nintendo Star Wars games, I actually played the Empire Strikes Back first because I saw the cover at my Mod Pa video game rental. I should just try this game out even though I haven't seen the movie. And I was confused as shit what was going on. But luckily, I actually saw A New Hope before I played Super Star Wars, and I was like, Oh wow, this is like really different from the movie. I mean, at least we don't see, you know, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru's charred corpses in a cutscene. That would have been pretty fucking morbid. So in this game, you take control of Luke Skywalker, and then after you meet Obi-Wan, you get Luke's lightsaber, which isn't very strong until, you know, you play The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And then later on in the game, you can play as Han Solo or Chewbacca. So the game is very much like Contra, but only Star Wars. And this time you have like rapid fire if you hold down the Y button. And you can upgrade your gun about like five times from the regular laser. And then after that you get homing missiles, and then you have that super duper plasma. And the game does follow the movie for the most part, although they take a lot of liberties, like the scene where Luke meets C-3PO and R2-D2 is a lot different than in the movie. Like, in the movie, you know, he buys them with his Uncle Owen from the Jawa Sandcrawler. But in the game, you see Luke looking over them while their, you know, escape pod crashed. And in the movie, you actually just buy C-3PO and R2-D2 from the Sandcrawler. But in the game, you fucking force your way through the Sandcrawler and shoot up all the fucking Jawas and like, now I've rescued them. This is like Star Wars, the hardcore violent version or Star Wars Contra version. And what is really cool about this game, you get these mode seven levels like, you know, in the movie, like you just like take the sand speeder, but in the game it's really badass mode seven mode. And especially when you get to the Death Star surface, it looks really fucking cool in mode seven, man. But I do gotta admit, this is a very, very hard game. Like I said, Star Wars Contra. Although you do get a life bar, the enemies can drain it pretty fast and you have to square off against these really, really hulkingly huge ass bosses in the game. 
Yeah, I don't remember fighting that guy in the cantina. You know, I would have just like fought those guys where they were like, he doesn't like you. Well, yeah, like having to fight those guys as bosses would have been pretty cool. Although it would have been cool to play as Obi-Wan and be like, I can press up and A and like, oh, you don't need to see his identification. Yeah, it would have been pretty cool to fight Darth Vader as Obi-Wan, but you still lose no matter what. And I would have actually preferred a Death Star level where you actually, you know, you have Princess Leia like right next to you and then you have to like, you know, swing across the tractor beam and stuff, but they kind of left that out. Well, the tractor beam level is still there, but it's more of a Contra type level. And I do admit the renditions of the Star Wars music in this game are really, really good. But my problem with this game is, you know, there's not a lot of variety in the music. Like, they play, like, the Death Star music while you're on Tatooine, like, over and over again. I mean, there's a lot more Star Wars music you can use, LucasArts. And unlike Rebel Assault and X-Wing, the Death Star levels in this game are actually pretty easy. Like, the first Death Star level you have to, you know, destroy the towers, kind of like in the arcade game and in X-Wing. But they're pretty easy to destroy and, you know, the Mode 7 graphics looks really cool. And the trench looks awesome for 16-bit. Like, I think the trench here looks better than the one in X-Wing and Rebel Assault. And yeah, it is actually pretty easy to, you know, fire photon torpedoes and win the game. But with Super Star Wars, if you want to replay the levels, you kind of have to use like the level select code that uses both controllers. Yeah, so Super Star Wars, has it stood against the test of time? I've played it again recently and I definitely have to say yes, it definitely stands the test of time. While it does follow the movie for the most part, it does have to add in a lot of extra stuff because, you know, the transition from movie to game, like, you know, the game has to be a lot longer than the movie. And yeah, it definitely is a very difficult game. I'm not gonna say it isn't, but yeah, it's a very fun game. And it's very fun to play as all three of the characters, Han Solo, Luke, and Chewie. And it definitely should provide a really good challenge. It's not super difficult, but it's definitely not super easy. And it's a lot easier than Super Empire Strikes Back. You know, surprisingly, like, while you can't get this game on the Nintendo Virtual Consoles, you can actually get this game on the PlayStation Network to play on the PlayStation 4, and it actually plays really, really well. Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is Super Empire Strikes Back. Da, 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 da. So Super Empire Strikes Back was actually the first Star Wars game I've ever played, even before I saw the movie. So when I first played it, I had no idea what the fuck was going on. Because I just rented it because the cover looked cool and I was like, I hadn't seen the movie, but I'm just gonna rent this game anyways. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? So after I saw the movie, I pretty much declared it as my personal favorite Star Wars movie like a lot of people. But sadly, this is my least favorite of the Star Wars trilogy video games because this is the one I feel that really, really deviates a lot from the movie. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong, it does follow the plot of the movie, okay, but they just add so much padding to this game. I mean, there's like a billion Hoth levels. Like, it feels like like the first third of the movie, I mean, like the first third of the movie is, you know, Hoth, but like, there's like fucking 10 Hoth levels in this game. Like, and also what really does annoy me, like Luke is wearing his X-Wing outfit the entire game. Like in the second half of the movie, when he goes to Dagobah, he completely changes his outfit, but the entire game, he's just in his, X-Wing outfit. Well, yeah, of course they had like a deadline to get this game done for 1993, but still they could have, you know, made a different sprite for Luke. And what I mean about how they deviate a lot from the movie in this game, you know, in those like 10 million Hoth levels, like, remember that Wampa that took Luke captive? Now look how big he is in the game. Holy shit, man. But if there's one thing I do have to praise about this game is the snow speeders versus the AT-AT battle on Hoth where you had to defend the rebel base so the transports could escape. 
Well, not only do they play the correct music for this stage, like they actually made harpooning the AT-AT legs really fun and actually pretty easy. Yeah, and they actually add an extra 2D level where you're in the snow speeder, but you're actually shooting because in the movie, like, uh, you know, Luke and Dak get shot out of the snow speeder and just like that. But in the game, Luke is like, I'm not going down that easily. And, and there's a whole level just dedicated to Luke inside the AT-AT where in the movie, he just puts the thermal detonator at the bottom. But in the game, he actually goes inside and kills the stormtroopers there, which is actually pretty cool. And what I truly felt was a missed opportunity in this game was, like, remember the part in the movie where Han Solo, Leia, C-3PO, and Chewbacca are in the Millennium Falcon and they're inside the asteroid, but they're actually inside that creature? Like, we do get an asteroid belt level with the really cool music, but the problem is we don't get a level where you're escaping from that monster in the asteroid. That would have been a really cool level to see, like, you know, the monster's guts in, like, Mode 7. And it would have been really cool to see the Millennium Falcon hiding behind the Star Destroyer in a cutscene. And also where they really deviate is when you get to Dagobah, like before you meet Yoda, you have to fight that gigantic ass swamp monster. Oh yeah, there is like a, also a zillion Dagobah levels. Like it would have been really cool like if you got to fight Darth Vader on Dagobah, well more of the pseudo Darth Vader, and then you beat him and then a cutscene it shows like Luke's face and Vader's helmet. Like that was a missed opportunity in my opinion. And if you thought the original Super Star Wars was hard, this game is very, very, very hard. But what is cool is, you know, Luke does get force powers in this game. Like he gets to fly, he gets to throw his lightsaber. And actually what's kind of funny is like in the movie, Han Solo just goes in the carbon freezing chamber just like that. But in the game, he fucking fights his way out. He's like, no way, Vader. I'm just, I'm gonna fight my way through this carbonite shit. And man, the carbon freezing chamber is really big in this game. And yeah, the final encounter with Vader, like getting to him is already hard enough, but actually beating him is another challenge within itself. And another huge gripe I have with this game, like in Super Star Wars, they keep playing the same A New Hope music over and over again. Well, in this game, they play the same Empire Strikes Back music over and over again. I mean, I love the Imperial March, but I can only just hear it so many times. I mean, there's so many themes that they could have put in this game. Like, I'm so disappointed they didn't put that super awesome emotional theme like at the end where Luke and Leia are at the frigate and they're looking at the stars. Like, they didn't play a 16-bit rendition of that. I wanted to hear that. They kept playing the same music over and over again, which is disappointing. So yeah, the Super Empire Strikes Back, while well, Empire Strikes Back is my favorite movie in the series, it's my least favorite game on the Super Nintendo. And I do think it still holds up as a solid action game, but as an adaptation of the movie, it definitely falls flat. And the force was definitely not with this one. Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is Super Return of the Jedi! While Return of the Jedi isn't exactly my favorite movie in the Star Wars trilogy, I mean, for me, it has to go Empire, A New Hope, and then Jedi. I do think Return of the Jedi for the Super Nintendo is the closest we have to the movie and is the best of the three games on the Super Nintendo. While the graphics are still awesome like the previous two games, the gameplay is a lot better. A lot easier than the previous two games and a lot more forgiving. And this time you get to play as Luke, Leia, and Slave Leia, oh yeah. Ah, Slave Leia. Every Star Wars fan, well every male Star Wars fan's dream girl. Han Solo, Chewbacca, and Wicket the Ewok, which add to a lot more variety in the game. And also, unlike Super Empire Strikes Back, where you had like freaking 10 Hoth levels and freaking 15 Dagobah levels, you actually do keep the Tatooine levels to a minimum and you get to go to Tatooine and there's this first extra level where you're on Luke's speeder, which wasn't in the movie, but I do think it was a pretty cool touch. Yeah, like on Tatooine, you get Jabba the Hutt levels where, you know, that, you know, that door eye is a lot bigger this time. And then you have, you know, Jabba's palace where you actually fight the Rancor in 16-bit and it looks amazing in this game. And then you get the Sail Barge where they play the correct music and you get to fight Jabba as Slave Leia. <laughs> 
and then you got the Endor levels, you have the speeder bikes, you got the forest, you have the, you know, the shield generator base, and then you have the Death Star 2 levels, which are really cool. And the space levels where you pilot the Millennium Falcon as Lando Calrissian and Nia Numb look really, really cool in this game. And while the game is definitely challenging, it feels like the challenge is just right. Although I do admit, you know, the last Death Star level where you actually have to go into the core and shoot it is a bit difficult, but it's definitely beatable if you play it long enough. And just like the movie, the fight with Darth Vader is actually pretty easy, but the fight with the Emperor... Well, in the movie, you know, Darth Vader just picks up the Emperor and throws him into the reactor, but in the game, the Emperor does not go down that easily. He's like, well, if you're not going to join the dark side, I'm going to kill you! Like, he fucking fights you like how the Emperor fights Yoda in Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Like, he's all around the place just shooting lightning at you like holy shit man i thought that was a really good touch like the emperor went down a little too easily in the movie but in the game man he ain't going down without a fight and because the game was made a couple of years before the special edition of the movies we get the correct ending song for the ewoks like bop bop ba da bop bop ba da bop ba da da ba da bop ba da ba and we see Sebastian Shaw and not Hayden Christensen in the ending. So yeah, Super Return of the Jedi, I feel, is definitely the best of the Super Nintendo trilogy because it follows the movies the closest and the challenge is just right. It's not too easy, it's not like super hard like the previous two games, and it definitely captures that feel of the movie very well. Especially when you play as Slave Leia. So at the time of recording this video, you can't get this game on any of the virtual consoles for Nintendo and hopefully it will be on the PS4 by the time this video comes out or shortly after. And I definitely recommend Super Return of the Jedi because it's not only a solid adaptation of the movie in game form, it's definitely a solid action game. Whoa! That wasn't a laser blast, something hit us! Well, while I'm trying to evade the Imperials, I'm going to play some more awesome video game memories, Star Wars episodes, while I'm trying to repair the hyperdrive at the same time. Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is Star Wars Rebel Assault for the PC. So the first time I actually played this game was in 1995, about two years after it was released. Because over the summer of 1995, I played a lot of X-Wing and TIE Fighter, and I was looking at this Rebel Assault game, and it was advertised as an arcade experience. And I was like, well, don't we already have the Star Wars arcade? Yeah, like the Atari one and the recent Sega one? So during my freshman year of high school, I actually took the bus to Egghead Software, if you remember Egghead Software, and I purchased Star Wars Rebel Assault for about 30 bucks with my own allowance. Yeah, I saved up quite a bit of money mowing those lawns. And vacuuming those floors. And dusting those cobwebs. Yeah. I was a pretty filthy kid just to get my filthy money. Well, since they advertise this as a arcade experience, I was hoping to get that same feeling when I played the Atari Star Wars arcade game and the recent Sega release of the arcade games. But hey, this one was actually completely different. Like, this is the first game of Star Wars I played that used music from the actual movies! Which I can't play here because of content ID, but hey, I'm using the Super Nintendo versions, which sound pretty close. Yeah, yeah. Even though it was cool that they used the original music from the Star Wars movies, it kind of lacked the charm of the original tunes they made for X-Wing and TIE Fighter. But still, it was really cool to hear the original music from the original movies. Although, the problem was there wasn't a lot of variety in it. For example, being the massive Star Wars nerd that I am, like during the Hoth levels, they're playing episode 4 music. Like, where's the Imperial theme? Like, where's the music that plays during the Snowspeeder? Duh, 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 duh,
Yeah, it kind of bugged me that they kept repeating the same music from A New Hope like in almost every single level. Alright now, let's talk about the gameplay. So the gameplay is a lot more of an on-rail shooter rather than an arcade experience. Like you're playing on pre-rendered backgrounds, well, pre-rendered movie type backgrounds. Which looked pretty good back in the day, but by today's standard, they're pretty grainy. And you play as Rookie One, aka not Luke Skywalker, as you're a member of the Rebel Alliance, ready to stop the Empire as not Luke Skywalker. So if you thought X-Wing and TIE Fighter were tough, this game is really, really tough. Like, really, really, really tough. Because back then, you can only play this game with the mouse and keyboard, and a lot of the times I felt that the controls were very, very loose. Like every time I would kind of move the mouse, like right or left, I would really go to the left or right. And I would end up bumping into walls all the time. But it took a bit of practice to, you know, just kind of get the mouse movements right. Although the controls are still far from perfect. And like the graphics, yeah, obviously, like I said before, they're very, very grainy, but they do kind of give you a bit of that, you know, cartoony Star Wars look from X-Wing and TIE Fighter, but kind of a little more realistic. And I kind of feel that it loses a bit of the charm. And I think they really should have went with the more cartoony style of X-Wing and TIE Fighter, and then just use like the moving motion backgrounds, movie backgrounds for, you know, the levels. And even though the game is difficult, at least the game gives you passwords, but I do remember back in the day, like, you know, the mid-90s, like, like, LucasArts, if you call them, like, you know, you call their gaming hotline, like, they're only gonna give you, like, maybe four passwords to, like, you know, one-third of the game each, which really sucks, but then I had to wait till I had online access before I could find out the passwords to the rest of the levels. And yeah, the levels are definitely very difficult, like I said before. Like, you have to have, like, precision mouse movement in order to not get hit by shit. And then you have to also shoot shit, too. At least they give you, like, cursors to indicate where you need to shoot. So you go through Tatooine, and then you go into space. You completely destroy a Star Destroyer, which is really cool. Although the Star Destroyer looks very, very grainy. But then you go back to Tatooine where the Empire attacks her base. And then like the guy at the stage is like, Aah! and then after that, you go to Hoth, which, okay, that's pretty cool. But they're, like I said before, they're playing the wrong music. I want to hear the Empire Strikes Back music. I am a Star Wars nerd. And also, one thing I really dislike about this game is there's a lot of parts in the game where you kind of have to choose a path. And if you choose the wrong path, like, you could end up going around in circles. Like, before you leave, like, Yavin or the Hoth Cave, like, you have to choose the right path or you're gonna get stuck. You're gonna keep going around in circles. And of course, the last part of the game is the Death Star, which is really, really cool. Like, I enjoyed the Death Star in X-Wing, although it looked very blocky. But the Death Star in Rebel Assault looks pretty cool, although it's a bit grainy. And you actually have several levels on the Death Star, rather than just, you know, the surface and then the trench. Like, yeah, you have a level before you get to the Death Star, and then you have, you know, the surface, and then you have another surface level, which is really cool. Then you have the trench. And after that, you fire your photon torpedoes as not Luke Skywalker, and then you celebrate at the end, like episode four. Although they did a really good job of taking Chewie and Han Solo out. Yeah, so Rookie One is the only one walking to receive his medal. Yeah, so Star Wars Rebel Assault, the so-called arcade experience type game, which is more of an on-rail shooter type game, has it aged well? Kinda yes and no. Like, obviously the graphics are very, very outdated. Like, this is like early 90s CD-ROM graphics. But back then, man, this was state-of-the-art. So if you want to get this game, the good news is you can actually get this game on GOG.com for a very, very cheap price. I actually got it during the Star Wars sale when Episode 7 came out, you know, The Force Awakens, and I got it for pretty cheap. I think I got it for about like five bucks. But regardless of its age and its graphics and its gameplay, I still highly recommend this game since it's a bit of a look into the Star Wars gaming history, like when they started using more full motion video and music from the movie. 
All right, so that ends this episode of awesome video game memories about Star Wars Rebel Assault for the PC. Welcome to Awesome Video Game Memories, where we talk about awesome memories about video games. I'm Ryan, and the game we're going to talk about today is Star Wars Rebel Assault 2 The Hidden Empire. So being a huge fan of the first Rebel Assault, I remember seeing Rebel Assault 2 in PC Gamer and I was like, holy shit, they're making a sequel to Rebel Assault 2. I wonder if it's going to cover The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. No, it's going to be a completely original story, and this is like the first time since Return of the Jedi that they filmed original Star Wars footage. I mean, it's like having another spin-off Star Wars movie, like the Ewok movies. Okay, I don't want to talk about this. So I didn't exactly play Star Wars Rebel Assault 2 when it came out. Actually, the first time I got it was when I was in the Philippines, and I bought a bootleg copy of it for about $5 and it was the full game on two discs. I was like, I bought Star Wars Rebel Assault 2 for five dollars! But then the discs ended up not working a year later, so I actually bought the legitimate version from EB Games for about like 10 bucks in the bargain bin, which was still pretty cool, so I just kind of paid double for a legitimate version. So if you thought the first Rebel Assault was hard and you're like, I don't know if I want to play the sequel. It's probably going to be as hard as the original. You're going to be mistaken, man. Mistaken for a good cause. Because Rebel Assault 2 is a lot more forgiving than the original. Not only is the control better, like you can actually enter a debug mode before you even start the game and just give yourself invincibility or unlock all the stages. Like you can just be like, you could be like a super Jedi like Invincible Super Jedi from the beginning. And of course there's no cheat codes, but even if you don't use the cheat codes or the passwords or the debug mode at the beginning, the game is still pretty easy to beat. So once again, you take control of Rookie One, AKA not Luke Skywalker, but this time you're actually not not Luke Skywalker, you're actually Rookie One, cause this is an original story, so you're not like reenacting any of the events from any of the movies. And yes, my Star Wars nerdism is finally satisfied that they're using music from all of the movies rather than just A New Hope. Like they play the Imperial theme, they play like the speeder bike theme, they play like the Death Star 2 escape theme, like all the themes that you love from the other two movies, episodes five and six are in this game. And also they've vastly, vastly improved the graphics. Like the graphics aren't as grainy this time, although they're still a bit grainy by today's standards, but back then like this shit looked really fucking good on my 486. And also the gameplay variety is a lot better. Like this time you don't have those really annoying sections where you have to like choose a path. Like this time you still have to avoid obstacles, but it's not as difficult since the mouse precision is a lot better and you can adjust the mouse precision in the debug mode even before you start the game. So the story of this game revolves around, you know, the Empire's newest weapon. Like what is it? Is it a new Death Star? Is it a, you know, like the Sun Crusher from the books or the, uh, what that thing is called from episode seven. Oh, Star Killer Base, yeah, yeah. Well, this time the story revolves around stealth TIE Fighters, you know, invisible stealth TIE Fighters, which are easily killing off the X-Wings and you as Rookie One, AKA not Luke Skywalker, or more like not not Luke Skywalker, has to stop them. And of course you have your standard on-rail shooting levels, and then you have your you know, vehicle levels where you have to dodge obstacles. But actually what's pretty cool is they actually added in these kind of Gears of War-like you know, shooting levels where you have to duck under cover, then shoot. And actually what's really cool too is you can shoot a laser at the wall and it makes like, you know, permanent damage there. Like little like burn marks, which is actually really, really cool. And also there's this really cool level like kind of near the end of the game where you're wearing thermal goggles as an Imperial Stormtrooper while well, you're actually wearing, you know, the Stormtrooper helmet. And it's a lot like Dark Forces where you have to shoot, you know, Imperial troops in kind of like a first person on rail shooter type view. And for this game, rather than using like, you know, voiceovers with, you know, kind of CG characters, they actually use real actors and the acting is a bit, you know, cheesy, but kind of, you know, Episode four, five, and six cheesy. Like, I'm gonna go to Tashi Station to get more power converters cheesy. 
Don't get cocky with me, rookie. You screw up one more time, I'll have you transferred to a refuse barge where you'll stay for the next 20 years. Yes, sir. Not to worry. If you mess up on your watch again, you'll be transported where you're going to be for the next 20 years. And I actually do admit, the voice actor for Darth Vader is pretty good, but the voice actor for Admiral Akbar is kind of like... It's like some guy trying to imitate Admiral Akbar. Rookie One, are you ready? Although it is pretty cool to see all those Star Wars costumes dug out of storage and being used again. And you know, there's a lot of space levels. There's actually a speeder bike level on, you know, not Endor. And then, and there's a really cool part where you and your partner dress up as stormtroopers, kind of like episode four. And then, you know, that Imperial guard I mentioned earlier is like, so if anything goes astray on your watch and like rookie one is like, yeah, uh, nothing on my watch is gonna get past me, sir. Uh, let's go. And of course, at the end of the game, you have this really cool kind of tribute to Return of the Jedi where you blow up the Imperial factory where they make all the Phantom TIE fighters and you have to escape it, kind of like escaping the second Death Star. And they play the music from Return of the Jedi there too. You blow it up and then you win the girl. And then in a post credit scene, Darth Vader tells the Emperor, don't worry, they haven't won. And then you're like, all right, we're gonna examine that TIE fighter and make stealth X-wings and oh, it goes up in smoke. Fuck. Yeah, so Star Wars Rebel Assault 2, The Hidden Empire. So has this game stood the test of time? I'm definitely gonna say yes, even though the graphics are definitely a bit outdated. They're definitely a lot better looking than Star Wars Rebel Assault. And of course the arcade gameplay is definitely primitive by today's standards. It's definitely a lot better than the original Rebel Assault and still holds up pretty well in my opinion because it's a lot easier to control this and you can actually set your settings in the debug mode like I mentioned earlier. Yeah, so you can actually buy this game on GOG.com for a pretty cheap price. I actually got it during the GOG sale when Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens came out in theaters. Like I got it for like five bucks and you can probably get it for around like 10 bucks and I still say it's worth that price. All right, I think I finally got the hyperdrive fixed. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed these episodes of Awesome Video Game Memories and punch it. Yeah! Fuck off Imperials! Hey everybody, Ryan here, and thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, especially subscribe, and make sure to click on that notification bell so you know when we release new videos because YouTube probably won't tell you. And if you want to watch me play games live, you can watch me on twitch.tv slash battlegeekplus. And if you have a Twitch Prime account, you can subscribe for emotes and a lot more awesome perks to support the show. And if you want to support the show, you can donate at patreon.com slash Ryan Molina because every dollar helps me bring you a better show. And make sure to follow me on Twitter at ThatRyanMolina and at BattleGeekPlus. And also make sure to check out the official BattleGeekPlus website at BattleGeekPlus.com. We got books, we got t-shirts, make sure to check out our awesome popcorn related t-shirts, our BattleGeekPlus t-shirts, and a lot more. And last but not least, make sure to check out these other videos while you're here. Thank you very much and see you later.